state right, statewide underwriters of this event include the Vermont Department of Libraries and the National Light Group Foundation, and the Middlebury Series underwriter is the residence at Otter Creek. Um, our speaker uh, tonight, we're really glad to have her. She's a professor of history at Dartmouth, where she's been for uh, more than 20 years. Uh, and uh, she teaches US history, women's history, and the history of race, ethnicity, and immigration, as well as Jewish studies. She is the author of Common Sense and a Little Fire, Women and Working Class Politics in the United States, and Storming Caesar's Palace. Mothers fought their own war on poverty, and she is co-editor of The Politics of Motherhood, Activist Voices from Left to Right. And just speaking with her, the title of her talk tonight suggests that she has been around to examine uh, the women's working conditions, social conditions, economic conditions, for a lot of different places around the world. And so that's what she's going to talk to uh, about tonight. So. Annalise Thank you. Okay, I, I turn this thing on. Can you hear me? Yeah. Okay, great, great. Um, thank you very much. And uh, it's really nice of you all to have me here on this beautiful summer evening. Summer finally came. I'm so excited. Um, I, I would also, uh, just to pitch a little more, I have a couple of more recent books. Um, if you're interested, one is called Rethinking American Women's Activism, and it's kind of a good readable general history uh, that tries to get away from the notion that, that the women's movement was particularly middle class or white or one ideology or another and tries to embrace you know, a range of kinds of, of feminisms that we don't ordinarily think of when we talk about the, the F word. Um, and I have a book coming out um, in March called We're All Fast Food Workers Now, The Global Uprising Against Poverty Wages. And you'll get a little taste of that at the end of, of this talk. So OK, here we are. What if poor women ran the world? What does that mean? Um, what it means to me is this. When we look at American history, when we look at any history, but for the purposes of at least the beginning of this talk, let's talk about American history. We tend to think of some people as the actors and other people as the acted upon. Poor women are generally described when they're talked about at all in, you know, in history books as the acted upon. They had problems, they got unruly, they had to work too hard, they tried to balance home and workplace, all of these things. What I, what I try to do in this talk and in my work generally is to say how would history look different if poor women and poor people's movements in general, but for tonight, poor women are, are the major players, right? If we see history through their eyes. So I'm going to give you a little tour through some of my work and also through that lens. Um, and you know, if you don't interrupt me, I'll talk for about 40-ish minutes, and then we'll open it up for questions. But I encourage you to ask questions um, and stop me if something doesn't make sense or if you have a question. It's how I lecture anyway, and I think it's, it's probably the best way to do so. So um, this all began with my grandmother, who was a garment worker in New York City in the early part of the 20th century. And, you know, as grandmothers do in real and apocryphal stories, she sat me down and said, gee, this is what I experienced, but if you look for my story in books, you won't find it. Now, in the many years, in the decades since she told me that, things have changed. And there is now a literature on um, the history of um, the uprising. The, I would call one of the first US uprisings against poverty wages, which began in uh, in New York City in the early days of the ready-to-wear clothing industry. And the ready-to-wear clothing industry sucked up a lot of those millions of immigrants coming into the United States in those years, you know, early, or late 19th, early 20th century. And it was rapidly changing at that moment, as it is now, and, and I'll come back to that later in the talk, uh, because of the invention of the electric sewing machine. It, Things got speeded up. 
and things got broken up in terms of the tasks that you had to do. Right? You had pride before the ready-to-wear industry. You were a tailor. You could make a whole dress. You could make a whole suit. Right? But by the time of the ready-to-wear industry, all the parts of the, of the process, the labor process, had been broken up. My grandmother sewed buttonholes for 40 years, if you can imagine. Day in and day out, 10, 12 hours a day, she sewed buttonholes. Because in order to speed up the process of work, um, the tasks were broken down, right? So that it was more assembly line-like. The beginning of, of Taylorite, you know, this idea that, that it, you know, you can, you can streamline production. And um, as I say this to you, I want you to think about some of the women I'm gonna talk about at the end of my talk, because Taylorite ideas are back. Right, in Walmart, right? There's a streamed, you know, things are scanned in a certain way, people are lined up in a certain way, there's a speed you're supposed to go, people are afraid to go to the bathroom. In Amazon warehouses, people are literally tagged with electronic devices, right, to see how many times they've been down and stand up, right? And so this idea from that era uh, is, is back. So what happened, 1909? A bunch of these young women inflamed with ideas of the Russian Revolution and um, with uh, Jewish and Italian radical organizing in Europe decided to rise up. Right? And you have something that came to be called the uprising of the 20,000. My research shows it was 20, 30, maybe 40,000 young girls, many of them, teenagers, old women in their 20s. Um, I think there were one or two in their 30s. This was, a, this was an uprising of young people, and, um, and it changed the way clothing was made in the country. Because over the next 10 years, there would be many, um, there would be many imitations or outgrowths of that strike that started in New York and lasted from November 1909 into the spring of 2010, and resulted in a lot of people getting union contracts, and resulted in something called the Protocol of Peace in 1913, which was kind of minimum standards for safety, for wages, for what was humane in the making of clothes. That too, we'll see is going on again today, right? An attempt, because um, one of the arguments that I'm, that I'm making in my new book is that, is based on a, a line that I heard at the 100th anniversary of the Triangle Fire, which I'll talk about in a moment. And that was, that was 1911, and a Bangladeshi garment worker got up in New York's Great Hall of the People in Cooper Union, and she said, first, let me say this, in Bangladesh it is not 2011, it's 1911. Right, so I, I just wanna give you a sense as I talk about this past era that, you know, that it's back. Okay, so they struck by the tens of thousands, um, captivated the people of the, of the city of New York. There we are. You can see them a little bit. They're blocking the factory there. Their arms are linked to keep, um, to keep scabs from being brought in, to break the strike, right? To keep other workers from being brought in. Um, they were standing against um, the, those who would break the strike. Uh, it's a girl's rebellion, and I just sort of want to wrap your mind around, like, you probably all studied the progressive era at some point in school. Th these are not the people you thought about, right? You thought about Teddy Roosevelt and Woodrow Wilson and Jane Addams even, right? But I would like to suggest that you think about all of these eras that we're going to talk about from the bottom up and think about them in terms of young women and girls and, you know, and this rebellion against slavery, right? When they're talking, that, that her, her, her banner, and it says the same thing in Yiddish, right? Her banner that she's wearing is not talking about um, chattel slavery of de a few decades earlier, right? She's talking about wage slavery in the sense that they were slaves to the machines. And that was the thing about the invention of those electric sewing machines. Right, the speed with which you made a garment doubled, right? And people began to feel that they were little more than extensions of machines. And they themselves started to study history in order to understand their relationship to workers who came before them. And they were very struck by this notion of comparing themselves to and seeking to rise above slavery. So that's this first group that I'd like you to, to think about because they really, transformed the way um, the government related to workers. 
right, through their strikes um, in, in New York, and then it spread to Boston, Philadelphia, Cleveland, Kalamazoo, Michigan, Chicago. Hundreds of thousands of workers were ultimately involved between 1909 and 1919, bringing almost half of the workers in ready-to-wear clothing into unions. Forcing the government after the March 25th, 1911 shirtwaist factory fire in which 146 young girls died. Um, actually, it's mostly young girls, but there were also a few young men, young boys. Um, on the streets of New York, terrible disaster, right? Everyone saw it. It's estimated that 10,000 people watched that terrible half hour on March 25th, 1911. When some of these same young women were killed in a supposedly fireproof factory. Um, some of the police were said to have recognized women they arrested in the strike a couple of years earlier, right? So they had, they had tried to prevent it. And that's one of those stories where your lens shifts if you look at the, you know, if you look at poor women, right? When we learn about the laws that are passed in the aftermath of the factory fire, it's only about the tragedy, right? It's about how the tragedy seared everyone's conscience, and it did. Right, and how Frances Perkins, FDR's Secretary of Labor, the first woman to serve in a cabinet post, was an eyewitness to the fire, and it transformed her life and transformed American labor law because she vowed to devote the rest of her career to ensuring that disasters like that would not happen again. That is all true. But the piece that you need to understand in terms of why consciousness was able to shift at that moment is that these young girls had been building, they had been working, they had been protesting, they had been forming relationships. And one of the relationships that really mattered was a relationship made by a young Jewish immigrant cap maker, who this is the 30s by now, she's no longer so young, um, with not just Frances Perkins, but the Roosevelts. So Eleanor Roosevelt, who became involved in an organization that Rose Schneiderman became president of called the Women's Trade Union League, decided when Franklin was recovering from polio that she really wanted to educate him to see social problems from the bottom up, from the grand mansion of, you know, high on the hills above the Hudson River where he had been raised pretty much as a prince. He had a sense of noblesse oblige, but he did not have a sense of how people really lived and struggled. Um, and so Eleanor, who became active in New York City in, in these um, these various trade union and progressive groups and peace groups brought Rose Schneiderman and her friend Pauline Newman, who had worked in the Triangle Factory, up um, to Hyde Park to talk to Franklin, to educate him while he was recovering. And, and so Francis Perkins would later say that the reason Franklin Roosevelt was able to sound like he really understood was from those years of, of talking directly to people who his mother was, was not happy to have Jewish socialists in, the, in Hyde Park, not her kind of people at all. But she, you know, she and Eleanor sort of worked it out. And, um, and so again, the lens shift, right? Roosevelt, the great man, he appears in Washington, D.C. in 1932 with this vision for change. Um, you know, actually, he had been working together with these folks in New York through the time he was governor of New York State with the influence of Frances Perkins, right, this triangle eyewitness, who herself was influenced by some of these shop floor workers, to, tr to begin to develop laws that might protect workers, to put state and federal government in the business of regulating safety for the first time, really. There had been weak laws. Right? But suddenly you really started to develop an infrastructure and this idea of workman's compensation if you get injured. Right? And, this, um, and you know, the idea of old age insurance, all of this as well as factory safety comes out of this era. So progressive era and, um, and we begin to, to move on. Um, and here I'm giving you a sense. Um, one of the things that Eleanor did, which I think was really interesting, is she encouraged the Women's Trade Union League people to have um, their, their meetings in Washington. And then she invited them to sleep at the White House. <laughs> <laughs> and she and Franklin would come down and, uh, in their bathrobes, 
to greet these young women who were overawed, to say the least, um, and to tell them, look, girls, if you get hungry, you know, feel free there's, to come down for a snack in the middle of the night. Right? It is this, this image of the people's house that we have never had in the same way before or since. And whatever one might say about how some of the changes of the New Deal were largely symbolic, you know, at this moment when the New Deal is completely endangered, um, I think every dimension of it, um, it's interesting to take ourselves back right, to this moment um, when, as one of the chapters of my first book is titled, one of these garment workers says to the New York Times the next morning, oh my god, imagine me, you know, Fagala Shapiro sleeping in Lincoln's bed. Right? And so it's this moment when, you know, the Fagala Shapiros of the world um, and the grand grandeur of the White House, you know, come together briefly, and and it, and it happens through these decades of you know of relationships that are built between the trade union movement um, and uh, and the Roosevelts. So then we get to the war on poverty, right? And during this this idea also comes out of extensive organizing and relationships built with a very different kind of president, Lyndon Johnson, Southerner from Texas, never had been, a, but he, was, he, was, he, he comes out of the Roosevelt administration, right, as a National Youth Administrator in, in Texas before he serves in Congress. Um, but he was, you know, not a strong supporter of civil rights. At this moment, though, you know, if you see Selma, certainly there's a lot of discussions between Lyndon Johnson and, um, and uh, Martin Luther King, but Johnson too, and the war on poverty too, is affected very heavily by this idea of a right to an adequate minimum income. You have it from workers, these are garment workers, a latter day generation of garment workers who, who Johnson brings to the White House to assure that the New Deal will live on. And you have it through a group that seems very unlikely um, to have any kind of influence in Washington, and that is um, African American former field workers who migrate out of the South as part of the Great Migration, this particular group beginning in the 30s, but mostly after World War II. Um, they migrate sometimes during World War II to be part of the defense industry and find themselves in a whole variety of Western and Northern cities where Let's just say the welcome is, you know, mild to we hope you'll leave when the war is over. But leaving the violence and the poverty and in some cases the real horror um, of lives in the cotton fields. And Ruby Duncan grew up on a plantation in the 1930s and 40s that was, as she said, her life you know, if you looked at her life in any kind of way, it seemed more like that of her enslaved great grandmother than that of you know young girls dancing, you know, to rock and roll, and you know the and and driving around in cities in the modern life of of the late 1940s. So this group then um, really begins to change our notion of what happens in the 1950s uh, and 60s. They haven't really been talked about when we talk about the civil rights movement. They haven't really been talked about when we talk about the liberalism um, of the 1950s. She would go on to lead a really powerful anti-poverty movement that kind of encapsulates what the war on poverty was all about. Here's Emma Stampley, um, also giving you a sense of some of what's going on um, in this great migration. Ruby came from Tallulah, Louisiana. Um, Emma Stampley came from Vicksburg, Mississippi. Um, and, you know, and the first step out of the cotton fields is an attempt to, to feed their children by leaving this archaic economic stratum and moving at least into some kind of industry. But if anybody knows anything about lumber mill work, it is among the most dangerous jobs you can possibly take on. Um, and I like to have this picture because um, Emma Stampley uh, would say about herself that she was kind of the archetypal welfare mother in the, in the sense that you know she had too many kids. By this point, eight. She was Catholic. 
could not get a Catholic doctor um, to give her birth control. So she had all these kids, eventually left her husband, who was abusive, was on her own. Um, and she's working in that lumber mill, the one woman, right, among all these guys, um, attempting to support herself. So they get to Vegas. And they, they end up in something that, that uh, the Harlem Renaissance writer Arne Bontemp would later say about Los Angeles, they end up in mud towns, right? And the whole idea of mud town is that there's no paved roads, there's no running water, right? You're living in another, again, you come to the city of Las Vegas in its moment of boom town, right? Las Vegas, 19, you know, late 40s, 50s, you know, is becoming the, the symbol of American glamour and people are living in tents, they're living in this shack is how people are living on the west side of Las Vegas who've come to work in the defense industry and the hotels at the height of the Rat Pack. This is 1962, right? This is Sammy Davis Jr. and Frank Sinatra and Dean Martin, all right? This is the moment of the Sands and all the glamour across the, you know, the way from where these folks are living. So what they find, Arne Bontemp describes just the weariness of, of one of these migrants. These women describe the heat, the unbelievable heat when they step off the train and they think they've stepped into you know, some kind of you know, blast furnace, Las Vegas in the summer, right? No air conditioning, no running water. This how people are living. You know, into the 60s, trailer with an outhouse. This is the west side of Las Vegas, the black side of town. So these folks, like the women rising up in the 1910s, decide to try to do something about it. And like the women in the 1910s, they're part of a national movement. In this case, the welfare rights movement. So this very idea of welfare and rights in the same sentence was then, as it is now, a radical concept. But they base their claim to moral authority on their motherhood. And they said, we are doing the work of society, right? If you paid us for our laundry work, for our psychological counseling, for our teaching, for the health care we deliver to these children, we would deserve you know, a basic stipend. So they, again, they begin to argue that just as the earlier generation of poor women argued that everybody, there should be basic safety standards, basic living wage, these folks argued um, that there should be a floor based on your citizenship to how little any American can earn. Certainly that the work of mothering should be economically valued. So, um, and this is national, right? Here we have um, Robert Kennedy in 1966, this famous walkabout in Bedford-Stuyvesant in Brooklyn. Um, and he's led about by a similar group of mothers, Caribbean activists named Elsie Richardson and a number of others who had been trying to organize around the same kinds of issues um, in their neighborhood. What? Running water, right? No rats, garbage pickup, you know, decent conditions, decent living conditions. Um, and they create two things. They create the community action programs, and the community action programs are really interesting. What they say is that community activists can bypass their city government and send proposals to the feds under this assumption that they know what's best for their community. And many of these neighborhoods, the organizers are mothers. And the mothers are saying, who knows how to balance a budget, right, better than we do. Right? Who knows what jobs need to be done? Who knows where the food is and where it isn't in our neighborhoods? Who knows what our kids need? Right? So they begin to organize as mothers and create the National Welfare Rights Organization um, as well as many other community action projects. But the National Welfare Rights Organization really is, well, there's one movement between the garment workers that I talked about and, and, and these guys that's worth thinking about. In the 1930s, you had these housewives councils and meat strikes and milk strikes and bread, you know, bread protests across the country as these mothers were arguing that, again, no matter the conditions of the depression, everybody's entitled to basic, you know, there should be price controls, basic staples. This movement is very much like 
um, like that one. Here's Johnny Tillman, um, who was the leader of the National Welfare Rights Organization. She came out of Arkansas, moved to Los Angeles. And um, in Los Angeles, she worked in a laundry and she worked um, sewing shirts, very similar, and ironing shirts, very similar to you know those shirtwaist makers from a few decades earlier, um, until her health broke down. And as soon as she had to apply for aid, she said, I ceased to be human. I cease to be treated with even the remotest inkling of humanity. And she decided this wasn't OK. And she organized the first welfare rights group that would later feed in to this national movement she would lead um, called ANC Mothers Anonymous. ANC was the California um, Public Assistance Program. And she said they put anonymous afterwards because that's what we were. Right? We were not individuals. We had lost our, you know, our identity and had become you know, welfare mothers who could be treated however. We lost our names. She went on to collaborate, as you see, with Ethel Kennedy. This march was an amazing moment because it was very shortly after Dr. King was assassinated. Coretta was there, marching for mother power, and very shortly before Bobby Kennedy was assassinated. So it's this, it's this moment of alliance and hope right, that is, is you know, very much affected by the violence of 1968. But Johnny Tillman was interesting because she said this is also a moment when feminism is rising in a broader sense. And she publishes a piece called Welfare is a Women's Issue. And she said, the piece opens, she said, the lies they tell about welfare mothers are just a particular version of the lie they tell about all women and all mothers. And she actively worked to attempt to, again, build alliances with middle class women and uh, particularly to raise this question of whether mothers deserve a stipend if they need it, to stay home with their kids, to take care of their kids, to raise their kids. And she pointed out that when middle class women want, wanted to leave the home and go to work, they were called bad mothers. When poor women wanted to stay home with their kids, they were called, you know, bad mothers. <laughs> um, and so, you know, they began to have interesting conversations about the no-win, you know, the no-win situation um, that, that women were in. Um, this is the same moment when there's some attempt nationally to figure out what to do with families who might otherwise be homeless. And you begin to get the rise of um, what they call welfare hotels single room occupancies in cities across the country where they're just these kind of like falling down hotels um, that end up being used as emergency housing. Um, it's kind of a disaster. And one of the things that these women start to talk about is affordable housing, right? We're talking about policies that these poor women's movements kind of gave rise to. One of them is the push toward affordable housing. And mother's activism in the 1930s as well, these rent strikes, you know, again, this kind of subsistence living um, protests really give rise to this argument that the federal government should be supporting affordable housing. And it becomes part of what the war on poverty does support. Um, here we have the moment before where the, where the tide turns and we head into the moment where we are now, which is the attack on welfare as a very idea, the idea that we have to start throwing people off the rolls. The head of the Nevada Welfare Department, George Miller, goes to California to a conference where Ronald Reagan is presiding as governor of California. And they begin to argue that we need a test case for welfare reform. We need a test case for starting to throw people off the rolls. Let's take Nevada. If you did New York or California or Massachusetts or Illinois, where there's so many people, it would just be, it would be too hard and there would be too much furor. Let's take Nevada, right? It's small, it's doable. And so they do, in the winter of 1971, 70, 71, throw a third of the people in the state who are on public assistance off entirely. They slash the benefits of um, the others, of another third, and the Nevada benefits were bad. They were, they were the only state they were above um, was Mississippi. They were very, very low benefits, like $141 for a family of four per month. 
1971 is a long time ago now, but it's not that long ago. Um, so they cut them off, and then they raise the benefits of the final third to say, you see, we got rid of the cheaters. We, we made the right, you know, the right amount. We gave the right amount to that other third. And, um, you know, and, we, and we, for the deserving poor, we gave, you know, we, we're giving more. We're not heartless. So they fought back. And one of the things you have to do, you know, this is Las Vegas, but from the poor women strikers in the 1910s who, who got people like J.P. Morgan's daughter and Alva Belmont um, to walk with them so that they wouldn't be beaten up by clubs, Ruby striking the Las Vegas Strip was worried about being shot um, by gangsters. And so the best answer is you take famous people, in this case, Jane Fonda and Martin Luther King's closest aide, the Reverend Ralph Abernathy. Right? If you take these very, very well-known people, there were other famous people who would march with them. Dr. Spock, the famous baby doctor, um, Donald Sutherland, the actor. And they shut down the Las Vegas Strip, demanding their rights and their checks. And they argue that they were unfairly terminated. And in fact, one of the things that they participate in, in great numbers, these poor women in the 60s, is um, to uh, sue in the courts to try to establish food stamps as a right, to try to establish the Women and Infant Children Nutrition Program as a right, and to try to establish the right to a fair hearing. You can't just throw a family off their aid, right? I mean, this is it was terrifying, right? You have people with little kids. I interviewed people with little kids who said, I, we didn't know where we were going home that night. You know, suddenly, suddenly, as a family, you're out. And so they sued, and they won in a case called Goldberg versus Kelly um, in 1970, which said that under the Civil Rights Act, I mean, it's, sorry, under the Social Security Act, of 1935, Title IV says that certain groups have a right to minimum level of assistance, not based on anything except their citizenship. Right? And so they won, and so they decided to sue, but they also decided to shut down the Las Vegas Strip because they knew very well that if you shut down the Strip for any period of time, as Ruby said, you stop the river of cash you know, that flows through Las Vegas and the legislators in Carson City and in Washington who are very tied to the casino industry will take notice. And that's what happens March 6th, 1971. Again, March 13th, 1971. Johnny Tillman and George Wiley, the leaders of the National Welfare Rights Organization, come. There are welfare mothers from all over the country. And this is the image. This is Mary Wesley, who just died, and her son, Alan, um, and that's the image that Nevada did not want, right? Because this, again, this is, the moment of the, this is the moment of glamour. This is the moment when Nevada's tourist industry is beginning to really take off, right? And they do. They come in. They carry those signs into Caesar's Palace, the kind of icon of conspicuous consumption with the gold and the red velvet and the waitresses and the togas and all the statues and the fountains. And you got all these, these little kids with their skinny arms in that sign, right? It appears in the Washington Post. It appears in the New York Times, right? And they say, so George Miller says we're cheaters. We're immoral. We're cheating the system. And they were very smart. They said, let us remember that this is the state of Nevada right, which was the first to legalize gambling, and where in the North, not only was prostitution legal, but welfare mothers were actually pressured by state welfare authorities to work in the Mustang Ranch brothel outside of, um, of Washoe and, and uh, near Carson, the brothels there, um, to, to become, you know, good tax-paying citizens, get on the tax rolls. All right, so they took a wager. They said, we're going we're gonna to juxtapose our morality as mothers against the morality of the state of Nevada. And it was very good, and they won in court. The federal judge ruled that they had been unfairly thrown off um, the welfare rolls. And they decided to try to create their own anti-poverty agency using this war on poverty money. And that, you know, had, Lyndon Johnson had been developing through the Community Action Program and through something else called Community Development Corporations that Bobby Kennedy pushed in 1966. 
Um, and again, it was this idea that poor people can develop their own neighborhoods. So what the women in Las Vegas do um, is they bring to their community its first medical clinic, its first library, um, child care center, community newspaper, and something that might seem a little bit um, luxurious, except this is Las Vegas where it gets to 115 in the summer. Um, when Las Vegas desegregated, they, they, they built their, their, their office in a hotel that had gone bankrupt when Las Vegas desegregated and people could leave the black side of town and stay in hotels on the Strip. It was called the Cove Hotel and it had a swimming pool. It had a swimming pool in Las Vegas in the summer where it's 115 and kids have nothing to do. So they renovated the swimming pool. Um, and they, so they did everything. They also were some of the first in the state of Nevada um, to propose um, solar collectors on people's houses the very early years of the industry. Right? What they did is they'd go to Washington and they'd figure out every possible program there was. Ruby talked about walking through the halls of various agencies in Washington, looking in, looking in, listening on meetings, trying to you know, check out what kinds of programs there were. They applied for everything. And they ran this Operation Life Health Center. Um, was an amazing thing. There you see Alversa Beals in front of the old hotel that they first opened it up. They ended up screening through a program called Early, Early Periodic Screening and Diagnostic Testing, which if you tested a kid and they showed up with something, you could treat them for free. They screened a higher percentage of eligible poor children than any federally funded pediatric clinic in the country, in the nation, right? It's this, this clinic run by a bunch of welfare mothers. Alversa Beals had a third grade education. Ruby had a ninth grade education. Some of the other women had a sixth grade education. But they developed an accounting system they could do, right? They were on the suit to unleash monies for WIC. They ran a WIC cl clinic. And one of the things they did is in so doing, they provided jobs for people in their community. Right, so they used social services money not just to treat people and to feed people, but to provide jobs. Um, so that by the late 1970s, um, they were one of the biggest employers on the west side of Vegas. Now these kids who they treated here and here, 50% um, of them had not once seen a dentist. Right? They had not once seen an eye doctor. There are all kinds of people they caught early um, sickle cell anemia, which could have killed them, but which they treated. And the way they did it was by giving jobs to these women who went out in Dorothy Jean Poole's old station wagon and just literally found people in their, in their houses and in the desert and all over and pulled them in. Said, if I can get my kids out of the house in the morning, you know, Alversa Beals had 11 children, um, you can get them out. Right? And, so, and so when these women, unlikely, Essie Henderson, Mary Wesley, Alversa Beals, Dorothy Jean Poole, whose station wagon it was, um, they were literally they were called to Washington by Casper Weinberger, who was then head of um, health education and welfare, and held up as a model for how you could run one of these programs, an anti-poverty program, without, um, without graft and, and do it um, do it properly. And in the 1976 election, um, candidate Jimmy Carter came to Las Vegas to also try to figure out how they did what they did. So here again, right? Here again, you have these very unlikely characters, these very unlikely poor women showing up in Washington as models for policy development. Not something that is ever discussed, whether they're talking about the war on poverty, progressive era. Um, and Carter appointed her to several different commissions. Commission on the family, very contested. If you know that history, I don't have time to go into it. Um, but also a commission on um, community development. She also lobbied for the, um, the Humphrey Hawkins full employment bill which did pass in a watered down version in 1976. But it, it has a very simple idea, which now is kind of hard to imagine. And that is that it should be the policy of the government to work toward full employment at a living wage. Pretty simple, right? The government has the resources to do it. Um, Ruby and Coretta obviously knew how to talk about it in ways that, that made sense. 
Um, for a while, this group thrived. This is a senior citizen apartment complex they're able to build um, with money from, um, from the Carter administration years for uh, housing and community development. Let's give you a little bit of sense of what, you know, what the scene looked like, this really beautiful alliance. They're still in touch. It's a real latter-day beloved community, and the folks who, who built that movement are still close. Um, again, there they are, their flyers for solar energy. OK, so there are women doing it all over, right? Chinatown. New York City is Chinatown. Um, Asian Americans for Equality, who become the largest builder of low-income housing in New York City in that era. In the Bronx, um, Evelina Antonetti and United Bronx Parents, a Puerto Rican and Afro-Caribbean organization which worked on schooling and, um, uh, and housing. In Appalachia, right? So I just want to give you a sense of this happening everywhere, right? In this moment when the government, for one brief period, trusted um, poor mothers to develop some good ideas. Uh, there's the women much later. Just give you a little little flavor as they start to be honored. Okay, so moving along to the present because I only have five minutes because um, I promise not to talk any longer than that. Um, moving right along to the present, where do we find ourselves? Um, we find ourselves in a situation where, as a result of the global economy and um, you know, the outsourcing of production of all kinds of things, um, from clothing to food, um, and the creation of something called export processing zones, right, which are kind of extra, and they're in the United States as well as all over the rest of the world. They're kind of extra national areas where national labor law does not apply, right? And they're, you know, they're created and kind of um, overseen by the World Bank and the World Trade Organization since the mid-1990s. We've got a situation, and here we'll talk about the U.S. and a couple of other places, but we're in the U.S., in 2015, 70%, 71%, I think, of workers are making less than $50,000 a year. More than 50% of workers are making less than $30,000 a year. OK, so somewhere between 30 and 50 is like a bare minimum level of comfort. You know, anything under 30. Um, is poverty, regardless of what the, the federal government's poverty um, lines are. And so people begin to fight back, and it's really interesting. It starts right around, right around that time, 1911, 2011, when I heard that line about it being 1911 in Bangladesh, I started to interview workers and meet people who said, hell, it's 1911 in the United States. Because right? those labor laws passed in the early years have been eviscerated by and large. Um, and you know, unions are disappearing, city services are disappearing. City services and union workers providing city services were kind of the bedrock at the bottom of the middle class, right? And so people begin fighting back, and they're saying employees on food stamps not loving it, poverty wages not loving it, using the McDonald's I'm loving it slogan for which they paid Justin Timberlake six million dollars um, to sing the first global. Um, fast food jingle, first global jingle. Just to introduce you to a few of the people who are rising up now, Maya Moncrief, um, child of Haitian immigrants in Long Beach, California. They live six people um, in uh, a one-bedroom apartment, but she's got big plans. And not only is she part of this movement, she's got this plan that she's um, going to become some kind of, a, of um, either a psychiatrist or a brain surgeon, very interested in the brain. She was out protesting the day after she took her AP uh, history exams and the day before um, her 18th birthday. Um, the whole Fight for 15 movement, these home health care workers um, are unionized, but um, they are uh, people who, some of them I interviewed, are working 120 hours a week, in part because they love the frail clients that they have and they don't want to leave them alone. Um, but as one of them said to me, uh, a woman named Ann Bruckner from Tampa, Florida, she said, for us, Fight for 15 is like, it's not just dollars, it's 15-minute it's breaks. 
right? We were just like, you know, a few 15 minute breaks during the day. Um, I would argue that this movement, as much as any of the others, has begun to change the way, in just in the last few years, the way we talk about a living wage. And we've gone from thinking that a $15 wage, you know, when I started this project in 2011, that idea seemed utterly ridiculous that we were going to double, you know, the more than double the $7 minimum wage, which we've been stuck at forever. Um, and now it's happening, right? In the largest labor markets in the country, in New York, in California, um, it's been passed, um, and it's been passed in many cities across the country. <laughs> Tiffany Faulkner, Walmart worker, right, who's begun to expose these modern Taylorite kinds of conditions in Walmart, workers being made to work while they're, st while they're injured, right, resulting in much worse injuries. Um, uh, you know, they, they sat down, very interestingly, um, in 2014, they also subverted Walmart's slogan. Oh, I'm sorry, I have another typo in there. Um, Walmart's pay less, live better, turned into sit down, live better stand up, live better, um, and they taped their mouths to show that Walmart retaliated against workers um, who uh, organized, even though it was still their legal right. Uh, and in fact, the National Labor Relations Board and the US federal courts have found several times that Walmart did indeed illegally retaliate um, and ordered them to not only hire workers back, but to post to, not just post on the walls workers' rights, but to read them to them that store managers would have to come in and read you know, to workers what their rights were. So I just want to you know, close with these people to say that once again we have an uprising and it is heavily female. This is Gershwila Green. Um, and they are also beginning to change uh, the discussion. Gershwila Green is founder of Respect the Bump. Um, which is an organization to defend pregnant workers. Uh, Walmart, which was the largest employer of women in the United States, did not have a policy of accommodating pregnant workers to keep them safe. Um, and so, uh, again, they sued, they struck, um, and they joined together with Peggy Jones, a UPS employee who won in the United States Supreme Court in 2015 in a case that said that it is because of the Pregnancy Discrimination Act of 1978, so some of these early earlier generations helped to pass. Um, companies are required to make accommodations um, for pregnant workers. I love this picture. Here's all the Respect the Bump people in their protest with their, their little pink uniforms. These are, this is a national organization of pregnant Walmart workers um, who are fighting pregnancy discrimination and for accommodations. Venanzi Luna. Um, who led the first strike against the Walmart in the United States in 2012, um, child of Mexican immigrants who, along with f refugees from the Salvadoran Civil War, now living in Pico Rivera, California, took on the giant um, and did you know, begin to bring them to the bargaining table, and then Bangladesh. The revolution we never talk about, we never hear about. There have literally been hundreds of thousands of women in the streets since 2006. Um, they brought up their wages um, from $6 a month in the late 1980s um, to $68 a month now through constant struggle on a scale um, that you, like this that you can see. And through the work of this woman, Kalpona Actor, um, who's dealing with one of the issues in modern um, global economy, and that is these complicated global supply chains. Workers literally don't know who their employers are. They don't know who are buying the clothes that they're making. That's by design, right? Companies keep it a secret because the big corporations like H&M, like Walmart, like Gap, don't want to be tied to these factories where people are dying. This woman, now 40, has made it her business. She started working in the factory when she was 12. She's made it her business to go to every one of these disasters. And mo the worst disasters in the history of the garment industry have all happened not 100 years ago, but in the last five years. And she goes in and she collects the labels because the companies always deny that they were there. So she goes through the rubble while it's still hot, burning her fingers and looking for invoices and labels and then holding companies accountable. She was arrested at the Children's Place in New Jersey um, protesting in 2015 because it turned out uh, that in Rana Plaza, the collapse in 2013 that killed 1,200 workers, more than 10 times the number of the triangle workers, and injured another 2,500, some of them for life. Um, she was going through the rubble, and she pulled out this label that said, for the children's place, made with love, 
in, in, in Bangladesh. So this is, her, this is her cause, and she too has moved the needle a little bit. She is the architect of something called the Bangladesh Fire and Safety Accord, which is a remarkable agreement. Pay attention because it's up for renewal. It has been in existence for five years. Um, and in 220 global clothing companies eventually signed on because of the pressure that people like this mobilized from consumers like us, like you. Um, and they signed on making it legally binding that they would allow independent inspections of their factories. They would reveal the names of their factories. They would admit where they made their clothes. They would allow independent inspections and they would legally commit to fixing um, safety, uh, when, safety violations when they found them. Calpona has, was just here and uh, she told us that up until this year, separate even from Rana Plaza, an average 200 workers a year were dying making our clothes. Um, this year, zero since the Bangladesh Safety Accord. So it's a real, you know, it's real, it works, and it's a shift in policy and capitalism. Here's, yeah, this is Walmart folks, the Walmart organizers, Denise Barlage, who will be here in Burlington um, in just a few days working on food justice issues. Um, really interesting to me, the Walmart workers banded together with the Bangladesh garment workers. They understood who was making the clothes that was sold in their um, store, and they, they got together to help pay for Calpona Actor to speak at the Walmart shareholders meeting um, in 2014 and face off directly. Um, she's been brought twice, face off directly you know, against the, not against, but speak directly to the Walton family on the, on the dais there in the big, big auditorium and, and say, you know, it would cost 1% of your personal dividends for the six of you to make garment factories in Bangladesh safe. Um, and there was a vote and, you know, not surprisingly, it was voted down, but they're continuing. And meanwhile, Walmart workers um, now have global actions every year in November, hotel housekeepers. This is Walmart India. Um, uh, this is one of the architects of the new fast food workers movement, an amazing young woman named Nkwasi Legrand, who was working three jobs in Brooklyn um, before she began to agitate for a living wage. Um, helped to build this strike May 15th, 2014. Fast food workers struck in, um, on six continents in 40 countries, in hundreds of cities across the US and around the world. So the labor movement is back and it is heavily a female movement, people wanting, it's fighting pregnancy discrimination, sexual violence in the workplace. Um, they want a living wage, here we have it in, uh, in Tokyo. Um, hotel housekeepers as well, I can't get into it, but again, um, global actions, um, Hunger striking is one of the main moves, and what these women in Providence who hunger struck through the summer of June 2014 argued, these are the people who cleaned the hotel rooms um, in Providence. They wanted a union, and they said they didn't, they said they would go hungry because they didn't want their children to be hungry. Again, it's the authority, the moral authority of motherhood coming into play here. Here's Mirjam um, Parada, one of the hunger strikers. Interestingly, she's holding the Communist Manifesto, which she insists has been misinterpreted all these years. Um, and she's doing a gloss. She's in her spare time, she's writing a new, a new annotated version because she feels like, you know, it, it should, it's still useful. Um, hotel workers at Harvard who took, fought for two years, ultimately um, having a bed making demonstration in the streets in which they got students and passers by in you know, Harvard Square and the most affluent parts of Cambridge to try making a few beds to see what it does to your back, right? In, you know, where women are expected to do this 20 rooms a day as well as be on their hands and knees using toxics on bathroom floors. Okay, so here we have just a few of the places where the worldwide strikes took place last year in the, for the last three years, Islamabad, Belgium, South Africa, Boston, hotel housekeepers again in Pakistan. Uh, Bangladeshi garment workers supporting fast food workers, saying a stand with the fast food workers, living wages and union rights for all. And again, coming to the White House, Nkwasi Legrand, when Barack Obama signed um, an executive order raising the minimum wage for um, contract workers um, for under federal contract, uh, he brought Nkwasi Legrand, so you know this is the third the third generation. Here are some of the celebrations that can't be as easily undone: the Los Angeles fifteen dollar wage, 
New York State, $15 wage. In Manila, the Philippines, and I just always like to end with her because I just, I don't know, I love her. Mm -hmm. Make up my workplace. Okay, so we'll leave her on and I am done and hopefully you have questions and discussion. I'm sorry I spoke so long. Yes? Thank you for coming and offering this presentation. Um, the way you've laid this out is really striking in humanity. Um, society. Yeah. And I'm wondering from your perspective, what would you say is the root cause of this, the, the underlying thing that allows this to perpetuate for centuries? You know, it's very hard to know, you know, how to characterize why some people are driven by greed and some people are more driven by humanity. But I think where we are now and where we've been at various points, I mean, I think, you know, the first group that I showed you and the people who are organizing now are organizing against, we're organizing against, um, Andrew Carnegie called it a gospel of wealth. I think we have a 21st century version of that in this idea that increasing shareholder value is the most important activity that we can engage in collectively and that, um, that's, that that's what governments should do, right, is break down trade barriers and uh, not, in fact, be providing for children. I mean, I, you know, I, I'm not supposed to be political here, but, you know, we could see the end of the public education system. I mean, I think we've moved so far away from this idea that governments are supposed to take care of people that it's a very dangerous moment. And, these people's humanity of these organizers and their bravery is really, I mean, it's kind of amazing. It's sort of, I don't know if you remember the image from Tiananmen Square of one person standing in front of a tank during those protests. I feel like this is the equivalent, right, is these people are rising up against unbelievable odds um, and violence. And I can't tell you the number of people um, who said they were putting their lives on the line. And that's true from the beginning. You know, from the shirtwaist makers, you know, Clara Lemlich, who's one of the people I wrote about in that first book, who had six ribs beaten, you know, broken by clubs, um, to, you know, these folks right now. Um, so, yeah, I, I wish I knew, but I do think that it's important for all of us to say, no, there's something beyond shareholder value that we need to be aiming at, you know, as a, as a human a human collective and, and as a country. And some parts of the country are. And some parts of the world are. I mean, there are all kinds of interesting experiments and collective actions, you know, that are making a difference now. And, you know, I, I could talk about them, but um, I, will, I will say that it's not that nothing, is, nothing good is happening beyond this organizing. There's, there's some good things happening via capital. The Bangladesh Safety Court is one really big one. Um, there's other moves. There's a group called Los Angeles Alliance for a New Economy that is using procurement budgets, city procurement budgets, because cities are now the most progressive governments in the country. Um, they're using city procurement budgets for mass transit to renovate mass transit, renovate bridges, and to mandate what they call community benefits agreement. It comes right out of the war on poverty, this idea that if you're going to get taxpayer dollars, You've got to let people unionize, you've got to be environmentally friendly, and you've got to be equitable in terms of you know, hiring women. So that's a campaign that's, that's really taken off in, again, New York, Illinois, and California, the three biggest labor markets in the country. So it's making a difference. Anyway, long-winded long answer to an open-ended question. Other thoughts, comments? I'd, yeah. I'm struck by the slides that move white people Mm -hmm. Is that an act of representative? Well, yeah. I mean, I think, you know, the garment industry had um, a handful of African-American workers. As you saw, by the time they come into Lyndon Johnson's White House, garment workers are people of color. But in that moment, um, African-Americans were not generally hired in industrial jobs. Um, and that became one of the... The, one of the interesting goals by the 1930s of that movement was to organize black and white women together um, in a variety of ways. And the first groups were hotel workers and laundry workers. It took a while before industry, really 30s, 40s, World War II, before they let people in. But yes, low wage workers are then, were then immigrants, right? Those women you saw were white people, but they were you know, Jewish and Italian and Polish and Greek, you know, mostly Jewish, Italian, Polish, and Irish. Um, immigrants, and those were the low-wage workers, female, because uh, they could be paid less than men. That's how the garment industry got its start. And now, 
workers, um, the activists are disproportionately people of color, women of color, and um, the low wage workers are disproportionately. But white men's salaries are dropping too, right? You know, in terms of wage stagnation in the United States, um, no one, no group has been immune. Yeah. No, they struck great deals. I mean, it actually brought the government into the business of ensuring minimum conditions, of ensuring that they could unionize. Um, some of those relationships that I talked about in the beginning, Mary Anderson, one of the Women's Trade Union League people in World War I, starts the U.S. Women's Bureau. Um, and that's because many men are serving overseas. The government needs women workers. Um, and so they strike a deal. The workers then say, we won't strike. But um, and they do, and that, and in World War II, that suppressed desire to strike explodes the second the war is over. And 1946 is the biggest strike year in American history. Um, but, uh, but no, they use. What's interesting is you still have people in government. They're build. They've built these relationships. You still have a moment when people in government believe that it's the job of government, you know, to try to you know, kind of balance things out a little bit to try to at least reduce inequalities and safety. So World War I and World War II actually bring huge benefits um, to industrial workers and, and women garment workers in particular and other kinds of factory workers. Yes? Well, what these women, what the, what, the, what the Las Vegas women started to say is, we can do it and do it better. That was their slogan. Um, and indeed, uh, as I mentioned, the programs they ran were more successful than programs run by traditionally credentialed professionals. So what, what, you know, what I'm suggesting is two things. One is um, that we need to be listening to the voices of, of poor women and to, un, you know, not just to feel guilty or, you know, or helpless, um, but in fact to see them as policymakers, right? And to understand um, and to, to, to maybe change the way we view what's good policy based on the kinds of things that they think about. In terms of actual prescriptions, you know, none of these changes would have happened without broad coalition building. Poor people's movements always need allies. And this is a moment, I think, when you can have a lot of allies, because I want to come back to that statistic that you know, three quarters, you know, 71% of, of workers in the United States are barely making above poverty wages, many of them more than half making poverty or below. So this is a good moment for broad coalition building. The Bangladesh Fire and Safety Accord was the result of broad coalition building. The reason that American corporations like Gap and Walmart have refused to sign, and the US military, by the way, um, is because we don't have the kind of consumer protests that they've had in Europe and that they've had um, in Scandinavia, particularly H&M is the um, second biggest garment retailer in the world. Inditex or Zara is the first. Um, in Spain and in Sweden, you can bet that the consumers have been pressuring um, those companies, that there have been protests. And so, you know, there's a lot we can do. There's a lot we can do. And, you know, and it isn't even about boycott. It's about it's about being conscious 
of things that were invisible, right? Weigh our clothes, just all of a sudden, yeah, you know, we don't even look at the labels on our clothes, but if we did, we'd see they're made, very few of them are made here anymore, right? And so, um, you know, one of the things that, you know, that we can do is attempt, you know, to, to kind of rip the veil off these complicated global supply chains. Same is true with the berries we have year round, right? Everyone in this room pretty much is old enough to remember that berries used to be a summer treat, right? And all of a sudden we expect it, right? We didn't, we didn't, we didn't know it was so great. They suddenly appeared in the store year round, 12 months a year, beautiful berries, most of which were under the label of Driscoll's. Um, and so what happens is if you start to ask questions, about how these revolutions take place, you know, then, then you, know, you begin to learn. And I think that's the most powerful thing that we can do. But consumers are immensely powerful. They have all the power, right? They have the power of the pocketbook. Yeah. Yeah. That that we did when I was young believe that the government should do something <laughs> right. when things got bad. Right. And, and uh, the things that we all share that was so very important to Roosevelt was something like social security tied us all together, united the nation as a whole, because everybody almost at that point, eventually almost everybody really was, um, entitled to social secu security. And his belief was that if everybody paid in and everybody took out, his argument was that uh, they will never, never end Social Security because we have that coalition. And that yeah. would tie in some of these yeah. other uh, elements of the social safety network that has also been in danger. Um, so what are your thoughts? I'm, I'm looking at the recent announcement of Medicaid cuts. And the fellow was up there saying, don't worry, we will take care of people that really need right, it. The deserving poor. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and, and I'm thinking, well, we've heard that before. Yes, we have. And uh, it's frightening to me. And that this, this, this moment of the 1930s had a serious, serious impact on the development of the middle class. And it is falling apart yeah. before us. Yeah, it is not accidental that the middle class has disappeared. It's not, right? You used to have a different tax system, right, where the top marginal tax rate in the prosperous 50s and 60s, right, approached very high for the very wealthiest. It came to almost 90%. Nobody was starving. You know, nobody, no, no, no rich person, as far as I know, lost their house. Um, but, uh, you know, by the 1980s, it was cut to below 30%. Right, so in terms of the money that government has, it disappeared, and you began to get slashes in programs, and then, you know, again, the unions that were city unions that provided those services, those jobs were good, they disappeared, right? Unionized jobs disappeared as, you know, as we outshored, offshored, and sent, you know, made, had our, everything that we make made elsewhere, right? And so um, I think people need to know their history, that's one thing, right? And not, you know, not assume that, you know, that, that New Deal era was something that we can't get back to. And I, I you know, I, that's, why I think, that's why I think history remains important. And that's why I think this kind of motherist idea of a, of a state that is caring, it could be fatherist too, right? A parenting, not fatherist like authoritarian father, but loving parents. That was the Roosevelt image coming down in their bathrobe to talk to the garment workers. This idea that parents, the state are, are loving parents who take care of people. And I, you know, even Ronald Reagan, when his budget director, David Stockman in 1982, wanted to cut social security, said you can't. That's what we cannot do. That's not true anymore. So that's the question, you know, is how we pay, you know, just have to pay attention and have to talk back and, you know, and, and have to kind of continue to, to cite this history. And part of why I talk about the idea of poor women running the world is because, as I said, they're the most, the poor mothers are the most stigmatized group, um, perhaps in the country, and, and the group that is only seen as a problem. And I just wanted to suggest this idea that instead, um, they're actually a font of good ideas um, and humanistic innovations and programs um, that have worked really well and saved lives. So, yeah, just thought, yes. That's quite 
involved in this? Or, I mean, what's your hope for that? Because it did provide an avenue for people to get better wages and better living, but it's really diminished. Yeah. The unions are very involved in this. Um, I mean, I think there's a new, a new labor movement that is forming all kinds of different organizations that are not what we would call unions. But there are global unions, the International um, Trade Union Confederation, um, the IUF, the International Union of Food, Farm, and Hotel Workers, organized those massive global fast food strikes, um, and also the hotel workers, global action. So those unions in this country, um, SEIU, the service um, employees international union is, is funding Fight for 15. Um, not all those people are, very few of them have joined a union yet because of the way bargaining union, units are constructed. There are four million fast food workers. To get, a, you know, to, you can't even, it's really hard to get, you know, to get union contracts in much smaller bargaining un, units. It's been almost impossible to imagine that. So instead, what they've done is organize people to get some pretty major legislative victories. Um, and I think you know, that the, they're hoping that the campaign ultimately will yield more union members because the unions will stop having money um, if it doesn't. And that's where this Los Angeles Alliance for a New Economy idea um, is really interesting, of using these procurement budgets to create, bring manufacturing, really bring manufacturing back to the United States. Manufacturing trains, manufacturing tracks, you know, actually working on, on bridges and, and making those union jobs. So that's, they come out of Unite Here, the hotel workers union. They're, the, the genius behind that is Maria Elena Durazo, who was a farm worker and a Cesar Chavez, Dolores Huerta protege, went on to head the AFL-CIO in Los Angeles. This idea that you can create these alliances politically, too. They're the people who they've registered. They used undocumented immigrants to register documented immigrants to vote. A million immigrants turned around Los Angeles County um, and, uh, and are continuing to do that, that to run. They're, they're encouraging workers to run for office, not just to give their you know, pay their, give their checks to other people. So there's a lot of interesting stuff um, that's going on, and the, the unions are definitely involved. But, um, but at the same time, all kinds of formulations and groups and, you know, community organizations that are of workers and that aren't, aren't traditional unions. They're not waiting for the unions to organize them. Yeah? Yeah, and that's, you know, these, you know, it was really interesting. In 1970, um, there was a meeting of administrators of the community action programs, these, you know, grants to local community organizations to do projects in their communities. And everyone there who agreed, everyone there, because it was seven men and one woman, they agreed that it was a failure because it had mostly involved women. Um, and they were going to try to figure out, women and ministers, they were going to try to figure out a way um, to get men involved. So they created the community development corporations, which were about business. Um, but you're right. I mean, obviously, you know, these, that, and that was their argument, that mothers, um, that's what they do, right? They balance the budget. They organize in their communities. Um, but I was having a discussion at the beginning um, before, before the, the session with someone here about microloans and that whole idea. And I think the argument that I just heard from Kalpona Actor, the Bangladeshi labor organizer, is um, these microloans are putting women in debt. They're creating actually really dangerous situations for them. She said, what we need is pay us enough, pay us a living wage. We will save the money. We will open our own businesses. We don't actually need to be tied into you know, global, in, you know, lending institutions um, of, of that kind. So, but yes, that statistic, I think, is, is a very interesting one, important one. Any other thoughts, comments, questions? Okay, well, thank you all. Thanks for coming out.